Good morning, Dr. Lamberg. Thank you so much for coming on and taking the time this morning to chat with me. I'm super excited to have you here, so welcome. Thank you. Um, so the first thing, you know, I wanted to talk about is if you can talk a little bit about your journey, you know, from more of that traditional dentist role into becoming an airway-focused provider. Sure, uh, Brittany. It's, uh, it was a very unique role. It happened in 2004 when I had two patients that asked me for an oral appliance for their sleep apnea. And I didn't know too much about it, so I made them the Clearway appliances and which they're very, very large appliances and the patients hated them and they returned them to my office so I didn't charge them. And I just decided that's the last kind of airway appliance I'm ever going to make. And then I had a physician friend of mine who lives in my town ask me to make him an airway appliance because he was going to get divorced if he didn't stop his snoring. And I told him, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I'm, I can't do that because I just made two of them. I paid the lab bills. I gave the patients their money back, and I didn't think that was a good business model. So uh, he he really, really pushed me, and he said, look, I'll pay for all of your lab bills. Just make me a whole bunch of them, and we'll see where it goes from there. So I figured, okay, at least I'm not going to lose money. I'll just lose my time. And he was a family friend, so I took care of him. So his name's Alan, and I made him six different appliances, and he hated them all. And I said, you see, these things aren't that comfortable. So Alan then said to me, why don't you invent me something? And this was a Sunday. After I made him six appliances, I spent tons of time with him. I thought that that just took, uh, let's just say, nerve, okay? Um, and I had some other choice words for him at the time. But uh, when he left, I was going home, and I started thinking, you know, I, I understood exactly what was going on here from making all these different appliances, I started to understand what was going on with moving the tongue forward, putting some tension on the soft palate. And I just thought that a lot of the appliances were overbuilt and, and large and cumbersome. So I wanted to make something minimalist so that the patients could also be comfortable as well as it functioning. And so that's where I came at this. And I started then, I took an NTI appliance and I hung down a little stalactite and to push his jaw out and he liked it, but his lower teeth were sore and his two upper centrals were sore. So I expanded it to canine to canine, the NTI, and then I put a complete uh, suck down on the lower so that the lower anteriors wouldn't be uh, proclined. And he loved it. And I looked at it and I thought, ugly. This is just really <laughs> ugly. So I scratched in my head and I went to a patent guy because I, I thought I, was, I wanted to invent something here. I was onto something something very, very small. And I was coming from this out of the box. I wasn't like a sleep guy trying to invent another mousetrap. So uh, I called my friend John Coyce out in Seattle and I love the Coyce deprogrammer, which prevents you from hitting on your back teeth. It's a mm -hmm. holy appliance mm -hmm. with a little plateau plastic behind the two centrals. And that, uh, that's really good for people that grind or brox. It protects the teeth. It also decreases the muscle activity. So um, I asked John, I said, John, do you mind if I use that appliance in order to build a mandibular advancement device? Because it's, it's one of those appliances that you make and everybody loves and you never have a problem with it. Very simple, very small and easy to get used to. And he gave me permission. He said, you, uh, I have no problem. Don't worry about any intellectual property. They've been making these types of appliances uh, that rely on something called proprioceptive inhibition. It's just an an anterior stop appliance to decrease the muscle activity of the elevators. So he said, they've been doing these in Europe for 50 years, so there's no intellectual property, so be my guest. So I took, an NT I took his appliance, which was a deprogrammer, and I hung a little thing off of it, and I put a, a little lower appliance in to protect the lower teeth from changing their position, and then I built on the lingual of the lowers, I built just a little bit extra plastic so that when they open and close, the thing that hangs down could push against that. So it gives it a little brace. And then the protrusive element, which is what I call the thing that hangs down and pushes the lower jaw forward, the protrusive element, I developed a curve on that to be parallel to the arc of opening and closing. So I wanted to give patients freedom left and right, mm -hmm. which you don't have with most appliances. And I also wanted to give them freedom vertically without going backwards. Right. And the only way to do that was to make some uh, mechanism that's protruding the lower jaw that is going to maintain a certain level of protrusion, keep the tongue out of the airway, mm -hmm. keep the palate 
the soft palate a little tense. So, and the lateral walls to prevent the lateral walls from collapsing. So it grew into that. I got a patent for that. Space Maintainers Lab started making it out in, uh, in California and they started inviting me to lecture on the West Coast. And then I started lecturing and it, it, the rest of it is history. That was 2005, 2011, I went on. It, it's funny because when I started, I'll back up a little bit. When I started with Dr. A I'll call him Dr. Allen, uh, I didn't know too much or anything. <laughs> so I went to Salt Lake City in June of 2005. Now that's a commitment to go to Salt Lake City in June. There's really not much going on. You can't find a bar. Uh, there's nothing, nothing there. So I went there and um, it was a three-day meeting. I walked into a room and there were 750 dentists in that room. Wow. And this is 2005 in Salt Lake City in June. And I just was, my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe it that this, this is something interesting. Everybody's, there are the boots and all the different appliances and all the different gadgets. And uh, how do we do diagnosis and what kind of other things can we find out how to start the patient and end courses all day long in two different main rooms all day for three days. So from that, I met up with, I found some mentors, people that I wanted to learn from. And I went to Minnesota and I studied with, uh, doctors up there and I went to California and I basically traveled a lot and I studied and studied and I really got interested in sleep because I found out that a lot of my own patients that I had for a while that was the cause of some of the breakdown in their mouths and I started to be really curious and in doing so I figured I might as well go get my board certification with the Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine so I went ahead and I started that process which is a very laborious process it's a little easier now because they want to have more people involved. Right. But at that time, we had to present 20 cases to them in wow. writing. And it was about, it was really, it was literally 15 pounds of notebooks that I had to um, mail to them. And that took about a year and a half to put together because 20 cases, they have to be certain types of cases. Mm -hmm. And the documentation is involves communication with the sleep doctors, the MDs, and it was really very deep, very involved. Mm -hmm. So after they accept your 20 submissions, then they, they give you a reading list, which at the time was 300 articles and two textbooks. And it was a month's worth of search just to get the articles. And my whole office, I put my whole, oh my, my whole staff was involved, like download this. I got this article, I got that article. And that took a month. And then it took five months to read the articles. Right. And then there was a test. And that was 2011. And then I went on uh, after that exam. They asked me if I would like to uh, be involved. They're going to start teaching how to prepare for the boards. They didn't have a course before that mm -hmm. year. Uh, so that made sense. So I did that for a couple of years. And then uh, I went on to um, I, I went on to writing and I started writing articles for Steve Carstensen uh, at the dental sleep practice. He was the chief editor there. And, uh, and Dentistry Today, I did a few articles on that in that magazine. And I, I realized from studying the boards that there was a common thread. The common thread in all of the board courses and all of the, in all the literature was if, if you have sleep apnea, it can cause this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an inflammatory process. And you can have cardiomyopathies, you can have breathing problems, you can have dental problems, you can have psychology problems, you can have obstetric problems, you can have rheumatoid problems, you can have cholesterol problems. And while I'm sucking all that in, absorbing all that, I realized that, wow, what if, the, what if we're looking at our patients and they actually have these medical conditions? How did they get them? Right. You know, what are the odds that they actually got that because of the inflammatory, the hypoxia and the fragmented sleep associated with sleep apnea? And at that point, uh, the light bulb went off in my head and I just realized this is an article. You know, we're, I'm going to look at the odds ratios of having sleep apnea if they have a, a medical condition. Mm -hmm. And that could be another screening tool because that's the first thing we ask our new patients. You're, as you know, you're a hygienist and you mm -hmm. get a new patient in the chair. Hopefully your, your doctor saw them before you, but most offices, they don't do it that way. You want to know what's, they look at their medical history. Right. And if, you, if they have 12 doctors that they see and they're on all these medications, it, you, you know, I used to just think, oh, that's a sick person. And now right. I think- and That must be a morning it, routine, having to pop those 16 pills. <laughs> <laughs> horrible, horrible. 
I mean, the pharmaceutical companies have the physicians yeah. well trained. Yeah. And it, and, it, and it's really it's such a multi billion dollar industry. Uh, yeah, I remember I took your I forget when it was the webinar. It either was the beginning of this year or the end of you know 2019 when you talked about your Lambert questionnaire. Um, so if you want to talk about, I mean, I'm sure all of this obviously led into how the Lambert questionnaire, you know, was born, but for those that are listening that, you know, might, may not know what it is, if you want to just talk, you know, a little bit about that, because it's just, it's such a good tool to use to really spark a really good conversation with the patient, because it's like proof right there. <laughs> They're checking off all the boxes. Yeah. So, well, first off, let me explain what, that there's a thing called validation of a questionnaire. And one of the most popular sleep uh, questionnaires is the stop bang. And the stop bang asks about snoring and tiredness and obesity. And uh, if, you've stopped, uh, if you stop breathing at night, it asks a lot of questions. And they're really basic questions. And it's been, a it's been validated if you get a certain score uh, on the stop bang test and you it's a short questionnaire then it's it's likely that you have sleep apnea and i thought that was a, a good form but it, it it's not it's not everything and you don't automatically when the patient comes in we give them the, a stop bang right. but actually i incorporated the stop bang questions into the lambert questionnaire and that, then i went on into a, a little deeper dive and i wanted to include all the medical conditions and so uh, it's divided into 19 categories and it's on one page because Questionnaire has to be on one page. It's, I, I guess it's a rule somewhere. <laughs> uh, so so uh, the first category is traditional screening questions, and that's pretty much the stop bang questions. Uh, it's got a few other questions on there, but it, if they check off a lot of boxes there, then it's it's a, basically think of this as risk risk assessment. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand what's their risk of having uh, a breathing and sleeping problem. So I want to know if they're tired. I want to know if they've had a sleep study. I want to know if they're snoring loud enough to disturb other people. Are they unrefreshed throughout the day? And you know, these are, is their BMI over a certain level? Mm -hmm. uh, do they have a scalloped tongue? Things, things like that. Those are really obvious things. But less obvious are uh, category number two, which is uh, cardiology and vascular medicine. Do you have high blood pressure? Have you been diagnosed with a stroke or congestive heart failure? You were a pacemaker. Now, these are things that increase the risk of having sleep apnea. And it's well documented in the literature. And in my book, Treat the Cause, Treat the Airway, I go over and I go over the statistics and everything is right from the literature. There are references there that will show you that if you wear a pacemaker, I think it's about 68, 70% chance mm -hmm. that you are going to have sleep apnea. And on and on for each medical condition listed yeah. in this questionnaire. Uh, this is just a way that the odds of you having sleep apnea are increased. So the third category, I'll just uh, go through this quickly, is pulmonology. And like, for instance, do you have COPD or asthma? Or is your asthma worse at night? Do you have difficulty breathing during the day? Uh, that's the pulmonology. Gastroenterology, do you have reflux? You know, and as hygienists and dentists, you know, you see on the lower molars and that you see the little these wear patterns that, that yep. are not from attrition. You couldn't put the models to touch. They're sort of round and you see a little dent and eyeball poking through like a little, like a pothole. You know, that's from the acid sitting there and that's from the reflux. And the reflux can be caused by the cessation of breathing. So if the patient has heartburn, uh, maybe it's not heartburn. Um, neurology, do they have numbness and tingling? So we know now that uh, the blood supply is, is compromised to the periphery after sympathetic activation from the sleep apnea. So if the blood supply is compromised and you're breathing less and you have hypoxia, then the nerves are getting less oxygen. So you're more likely to have uh, those neuropathies. The endocrinology thing is diabetes. The risk of having sleep apnea for diabetics is high enough so that if you do have a diabetic, you should be uh, asking them sleep questions and giving them a home sleep apnea test perhaps. And otolaryngology, which is the ear, nose, and throat component, um, you know, we want to know if they can breathe through their nose. That's the key point in that one. Uh, urology, if they have erectile, if the guys have erectile dysfunction, um, or if women leak urine um, involuntarily, uh, or if there's decreased interest in sex, you know, this has to do with blood flow to the periphery. 
And whenever you have apnea, you have sympathetic activation. When you have sympathetic activation, the body is preparing for fighting the monsters. And right. in doing so, it wants the blood to go to your muscles. So it, it closes down those blood vessels in the periphery. Dentistry is another category. That's category nine. That's a really big category. And perhaps, uh, Brittany, just a suggestion in the future, I think we could do a program just on chapter nine. Yes. Because, you know what I mean? It's oh, like, it's, what are you seeing? And what, where did that come from? Uh, that grinding, or the, the, the cracking down, the front, the front teeth wearing down. Uh, you know, all of all these little signs and symptoms, yeah. are the teeth crowded? There's the growth and development piece, which is another rabbit hole, which we'll leave for another day. Then yeah. the psychology and psychiatry, people uh, have insomnia, depression. So the people that come in now and they're on Prozac and other meds, I'm, I'm immediately thinking maybe they're just having a problem sleeping at night. Mm -hmm. uh, rheumatology, have you been diagnosed with gout? That has to do uh, having gout, as you know, that's uric acid crystals that are precipitating in the joints, causing severe pain. And that happens when there is a acidification of the blood, which is, goes with hypoxia, buildup of carbon dioxide. And uh, that's another interesting conversation. But so if they have gout or they're on any medication or special diets, that's another reason I'll give them a sleep study. Dermatology. Now, if you have atopic dermatitis, that's eczema or psoriasis, it's an increased odds ratio that you'll have OSA. And ophthalmology. There's a bunch of eye syndromes that are related to sleep apnea. And there's an increased risk of having sleep apnea if you have them. The pain thing, which is chronic pain, chapter 14 is interesting because uh, people have headaches, chronic headaches. They're on pain medication. And we know now that there's a bi-directional relationship between pain and, and sleep and the pain will keep you up at night and less sleep will cause more pain. Yeah. And you know, that's, I'm just doing a shallow review here. Yeah. Uh, hepatology, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I started looking into this because the, uh, the CEO of the American Academy of um, Fat, fatty liver is, is a whole academy in, in New York, and she, this patient of mine is a CEO. And I told her she was a nurse and she got into this. And mm -hmm. uh, I said, You know, I'm going to look into this. And sure enough, I found that there's a relationship between right. non alcohol fatty liver, it's an inflammatory pathway. Mm -hmm. Oncology, well, we know that cancers do much better in a hypoxic environment, and so there's an increase in cancer risk. And obstetrics is very interesting. I actually uh, I met with some uh, obstetricians yesterday, and I found out that they didn't, didn't even think about sleep apnea. And they're all young guys, and they're working for this Northwell. And it was very, their lights went on. I said, oh, my God, that's right, because they have preterm births are associated with sleep apnea. Sleep apnea can happen when the, the lung volume is decreased. If you have a baby, <laughs> it's just pressing on the lungs yeah. or your neck. The neck, uh, when you lie down at night, a lot of fluid, there's a rostral fluid flow, which uh, causes a decrease in the airway lumen. Mm -hmm. So that, that adds to the collapsibility of the air because it makes it travel faster. And so there's a real good, I, I, we have some really good groundwork we, we laid yesterday. And they're going to think about that when people gain, gals gain a lot of weight during the third trimester. Uh, it might be healthy to just make them an airway appliance or put them on CPAP. Yeah if they're high risk kind yeah. of uh, birth. So nephrology is a kidney disease and, and that's really interesting also. And then there's the pediatric thing. So basically there's a couple of things that are going on with this questionnaire. So let me back up <laughs> and give you the overview. The overview uh, is A, it is a real good, uh, you get a really good sense of who your patient is in front of you. Yes. You know, how many risk factors do they have that they have sleep apnea? B, this provides um, an invitation to your physicians in your area to know that you're studying this. Right. So I would give a copy of this book to the physicians yep. in your area and discuss with them. Primary care also, mm -hmm. not just the ENTs and mm -hmm. the obstetricians and the psychologists. Right. You know. But I would, I would invite your community to let them know that this is a passion and this is something you're interested in and this is something that you're, um, you're 
being able to treat some of the failures that they're having out there. And also when I give these, this book, I give this book to all my patients. I, I don't suppose everybody's going to want to give a book to all their patients, but you at least give the questionnaire yeah. to all these patients and the questionnaire, they, we give them an extra copy. They take it home. It sits on the kitchen table maybe for a day or two. Mm -hmm. And people look at this and nobody ever thought that any of these things could be a result of having a sleep and breathing problem. Right. And you so, know, I feel like they, it's hard for them to wrap their head around that not all these chronic diseases are, have that genetic component to it because a lot, that's what, you know, we think, oh, my father had sleep apnea or my father had right. heart attack issues, right. you know, and now we're kind of flip-flopping everything on them. So it definitely makes them think, right. oh, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so they become the patients that are our patients of record become prophets. Mm -hmm. And in other words, like they might hear their aunt uh, all of a sudden is on these medications and she's having side effects, and then she might say to the aunt, "Did you have an airway evaluation? Did you ever, ever have a sleep study?" Yeah. So it's educating our patients, mm -hmm. edu educating the public, educating the physicians in your area, as well as finding out that the patient in front of you is at risk and needs a sleep right. study. So yeah. it does it has multiple purposes. For sure. Yeah, I had um, a patient yesterday, actually. I had treated her daughter uh, maybe like a year ago, and she follows my social media accounts for CT oral facial myology and sees, you know, all my, I'm constantly posting, obviously, all airway stuff. And she okay. contacted me and she was like, you know, I feel like everything that you post, she's like, I can check off. She's like, and my father, you know, just got diagnosed with sleep apnea. So, you know, I really want to come in, you know, for an evaluation to see what your thoughts are. And she checks off a lot of boxes. And I, it, it just made me happy to know that I was reaching somebody, you know, through all those posts, because obviously that's what we want to do. We want the word to get completely out, you know, to the masses. And I love your book because I love how at the end, um, you know, you have all the, the fast facts and it's like. Right. For those people that need that clear written, like this percent, it, it's just, I love the book. Every patient that, you know, I send for a sleep study, I always suggest this book to. Um, I actually just gave it to my uncle, a copy of it to my uncle to read, because um, he's going through some stuff. He just re recently got diagnosed with sleep apnea, and um, you just break it down so well. I think it's, it's a big eye opener, and it's easy to read. Yeah, I, it was intended for the general reader, not not right. for dentists and not for physicians. And each each of these chapters, then uh, each category in the Lambert questionnaire becomes a chapter in the book. Mm -hmm. And I tried to keep the chapter to two to three pages, just mm -hmm. explaining the relationship yeah. in simple terms in English, and then then the fast facts, and then the references. If somebody really wants to understand it, so probably the people, you know, the general public, if they have one of these problems in one of these categories. They can go just right to that chapter so that it under, they can understand the connection. Right. Absolutely. Um, what about the patients that you have that come into the office that, you know, might not have obstructive sleep apnea or they have their sleep study done and they don't have all those apneic events, but mm -hmm. obviously more upper airway resistance syndrome, which I feel like, again, kind of goes undiagnosed a lot. Um, and a lot of these, you know, women, you know, the, the skinny, you know, fit female version of, you know, sleep apnea, I'm here quoting here. Um, it's like, they can't wrap their head around the fact that they might have some kind of sleep issue because we all think, or the general public thinks, oh, sleep apnea, you think of an overweight person that just like snores to no end, stops breathing. And to get these patients, you know, to understand or the patients, you know, I have a lot of younger women that come in that have insomnia and they're like, oh, well, you know, I've never been a good sleeper, so I, I don't really think it has to do with anything. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, uh, I know, I know the type that you're talking about. They're like a poodle. They're very high strung, <laughs> and the nerves and their skin. They look. They usually are very attractive and yep. very fit, uh, but there's a. They're very tense, and if you said boot, they would probably just you know yep. crack and drop on the floor. That so uh, that's the type. Uh, and uh, so upper airway resistance is really something that's, it's one of those hidden things. It's one of those, um, it, nobody looks at that. Mm -hmm. And it really should be looked at. And uh, the, the reason for that is, and why it's worse, it, 
than even the obstructive sleep apnea is they can have just a little bit of mild resistance. And based on the individual, that can set off their sympathetic nervous system, just the resistance in the airway without having the obstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the sympathetic activation all night long, it, as you know, dumps cortisol in, in, into the system as well. And it, there's, there's certain things that are occurring biologically in these people because of the resistance in their airway uh, that it, they can't sleep. It fragments, it fragments their sleep from the little mini arousals. And, and they really are quite a mess. And the problem is that nobody, nobody knows that. And the insurance companies don't recognize it, even though it is considered a sleep-related breathing disorder. It's on this continuum. Mm -hmm. If they don't have five apneas or hypopneas per hour, then the insurance companies don't recognize it as anything worth treating, which is right. it's a crime. It's just it's the way insurance companies are. They don't always do the right thing. They, mm -hmm. they do what's cost-saving for them. So we, we identify them through other means. And when we do identify them and we make them an oral appliance, uh, then believe it, it's very strange. They do very well. They're very easy to treat because yeah. they don't have a lot of, they don't have a high BMI. They don't have problems that a lot of those larger men, truck drivers that we were talking right. about, don't have those problems. So sometimes we just put a little tension on, on the soft palate and mm -hmm. the lateral the walls maintain a uh, better patency in, in the airways and the oral pharynx. So um, we do really well with the upper airway resistance syndrome. And uh, those are the people that will check off uh, the category uh, number 10 or chapter 10, which is psychology and psychiatry. So there's, there's really, uh, you know, that, that applies to that chapter. And it's really, really common and it's really overlooked. And, and sadly, if you went to primary care physicians, I, I don't think many of them may even have heard of, their, of that. They and know I, about sleep. I'm after. always asking, you know, my patients, does your, does your doctor know that you don't sleep well? No, yeah. I don't think I ever mentioned it. And, you know, people just <laughs> completely overlook it and sleep is just, yeah. in, as we know, incredibly valuable and completely necessary. Um, yeah. what, so you, what a uh, home sleep study test do you guys do uh, in the office? Well, uh, at the very beginning, I got involved with Itamar's uh, test. Okay, that's called the watch pat. Mm -hmm. And the pat stands for um, peripheral arterial tonometry. So it's a, it's a plethosmography probe, which goes on the fingertip. And what's really, I find to be really useful about this particular one and why it's so valid is that in the fingertip, there's a, a large concentration of uh, blood, little arterioles, which mm -hmm. the size of them changes. And, and it's based on alpha, alpha adrenergic uh, nerve input. And so th that's what happens when you have a sympathetic activation, the alpha adrenergic stim are stimulated and the blood vessels are closed in the periphery and the fingertips has a lot of these little arterioles. So what they did, and, and this came out of Technion, which is like MIT version in Israel. So this Technion <laughs> University came up with this little probe that you put your finger in and there's a balloon inside and it measures the changes in the pulsatile volume of the blood flow in the fingertip. So it's truly a measure of sympathetic activation. Right. And this, this isn't even done in the PSG. Mm -hmm. in the, and you go to a sleep lab, they don't even do that. So it's really useful to me. I know when they're having events. And if you look at the signal of the peripheral arterial tonometry, you can see when they're having their sympathetic events and how it relates to their oxygen levels. And they have a very nice compressed report that's three pages long, mm -hmm. which is color, graphics, pie charts, or charts, and you can show the patient and immediately you can communicate what's going on. I find the PSGs, every time they go to a sleep lab, they're all different. They come out of my fax machine and you can't hardly read anything. <laughs> uh, there's no uniformity in, you know, in the industry. So they're all very, very different. So the HSAT, as we call them, home sleep apnea test, that I use is the watch pad. And they're coming, they're coming a long way with that. As a matter of fact, now, you can take it home, you can plug it into your computer in the morning, and you can throw it away. So we're, we're moving more towards these disposable home sleep tests. And I believe, uh, I know some people that are working on the, uh, the Apple, on the watch, and okay. the iPhone, and, and we're working 
uh, I, the people that I've spoken to there are working on getting more and more uh, data points from yeah. sleep that can be then transmitted somewhere. So it's what, very interesting. Um, what tracking type app would you recommend to patients to begin tracking, you know, their snoring levels, their sleep levels? Yeah, I mean, the tracking apps are kind of interesting. There's, there's a whole bunch of them. I guess Snorlab is, is yeah. the most popular one out there. And so the Snorlab's fine. It, it, you know, it's like they tell you the quality of your sleep in the morning. It's way overstated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's not really much, um, you know, science behind some of it, but, uh, but I, that being said, I've, I've had patients who are, were titrating or, or calibrating yeah. the position that they want their mandibular advancement device to be mm -hmm. at. And, uh, and sometimes that's helpful. My wife says, I'm not snoring anymore. And my snore lib says the same thing. Yeah. So, so, all right, I, I, give in to that you know there, there's some usefulness to them yeah I think not, if anything for, it serves yeah. you know just to bring some awareness to the patient if they're like sure. completely in denial that they have any kind of issue going on um you know right. like for the the kids I'm always recommending to the parents to you know pop in there take a video of the kids sleeping because once they're past a certain age I mean it's not normal for a parent to go in there and check on the kid I mean if they're eight, nine, 10, however old they are, and they've been sleeping, you know, in their bedroom with no problem, it's, there's not a lot of parents that are going to continue going in there to check on them. So when I start asking right. them, like, you know, is there audible breathing? Are they snoring? Do they move around a lot? Is their mouth open? Is their head tilted? They're like, I have no idea. I don't sleep with them. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So if you had three um, starting tips to offer to you know, a dental practice that is starting to become airway focused and wanting to get into more airway focused dentistry, what would be three tips like off the bat that you would suggest? Well, the easiest and quickest thing, you can go to my website or maybe your website. You can download the Lambert questionnaire mm -hmm. uh, and I would make that part of their initial, all of your patients should, mm -hmm. should take that questionnaire. Yeah. If you have a practice and most, the average practice, maybe 800 to 1,000 patients in a practice, uh, just think of it as you're educating 800 to 1,000 people right. and everybody that they know. And when we give it to them, you know, we, we ask them to read, read it over and check off anything that applies. And then we give them another copy to bring home mm -hmm. and to share. So you might hit up 1,600 to 2,000 people you might be educating. And then they might educate other people. Of course, uh, the book will explain this in, in a little bit more detail, more granularity. If you want to have more deeper understanding of it, um, then treat the cause, treat the airway is the book. Uh, and then, then I would say to take some courses. And there's lots of different courses out there. Uh, some of them are run by laboratories who want you to make a certain appliance. Uh, some of them are quite commercial. And I would say try to stay to courses that have a reputation for being more evidence-based and, and less commercial. Do you have so, a course in, in mind that you would recommend? Uh, well, I, I give a course in, on Long Island. We do it twice a year. It's two days. And okay. but the, the, it's interesting the way we set it up is you have to bring your whole office. I think one. Uh, so important. <laughs> I know, like how can the doctor go away for course and come back and want to do this? Uh, so let's be, let's get really honest here. Let's, the rub, yeah. When the rubber hits the road and the patient's in the chair mm -hmm. and they checked off a lot of things and the doctor took the course and he wants to make an appliance, mm -hmm. how much is it going to cost? It's not a night guard. Right. It is a sleep appliance. You're going to have to follow it up. You have to learn how to set it up in the beginning, mm -hmm. how to adjust it, and then how to evaluate if it's working or not and how to communicate with the physicians. So right. uh, I do like to have certain software. I like Dental Writer software, for instance, and that helps me communicate with all of that patient's physicians, which is okay. really great. In a way, you can think of it almost as a marketing tool. Yeah. It's not. It's not really truly a marketing tool, but it, it is a marketing tool. And what I mean by that is uh, when the patient comes in, we do an airway exam and, on the software. And on the software, there's a category for all the recipients. Mm -hmm. So all if the patient has 12 doctors, yep. they all get a copy of this letter. Oh, awesome. So that then, the, then those doctors know that you're making a sleep appliance. So right. I think you, you need that. You need software. The software costs 
you know, a few thousand bucks. It's not the end of the, it's not huge. Right. Now, there are courses I know out there that try to sell you rhinometry and uh, pharyngometry. And if you buy uh, these, these devices, you're going to take a weekend course, spend $25,000 and you're going to come back to your office and it's going to collect dust. Yeah. So I would say, you know, we always have to look when we bring new things into the office, not just at the return on the investment, but what is the point of entry? Mm-hmm. So not just on the return on investment, but what is the point of entry? I said twice because, of course, you have to have a return on your investment. You're going, you're taking time away from your family, your life. You're taking a course and the hotels and flights and everything. You want to, you don't want to do that for nothing. So you want to do it for the health of your patients, but you also have to do it in a way that's profitable. Mm-hmm. But in addition to that, you, you really want to make sure that uh, your point of entry doesn't bury you. Mm-hmm. So you have to start at one level and then build. Yeah. And the way to do that, I think, is not to buy a lot of fancy equipment at the beginning. Mm-hmm. It's just to take a good course. And we give, the courses are, are reasonably priced and it's a clinical course too. We have hands on. Uh, it's on uh, it's on Long Island. And as I said, it's twice a year. We do it at my yacht club. I rent out the yacht club for a couple of days. Nice. And it's a lot of fun. It's on the water. They have really when, good um, Cause we, I could link, um the course registration site or whatever um when's the next offering we don't have a date right now because we had to cancel it twice because of covid yeah so and i have yeah we we the next course was filled and i we had offices coming from germany and seattle and texas yeah it's so nice we we have a lot of fun we have a big cocktail hour after the first night which I, in an art gallery, which is a lot of fun. Everybody gets to meet people from yeah. all over. And it's, so it's a social thing as well. But right. we actually, my feeling is that I want them to be able to go home and start doing this. And, and in saying that, I, what is really important is to start. And I think your question goes right to this point. How do you, you know, what's the practical starting point here? Mm-hmm. You, need a, you need a front desk people. You need an administrator. Um, I have a person that just does sleep, a manager, office manager for sleep. And I have another one for dentistry. I do both. Yeah. And you're not going to have that at the beginning. Right. So you're going to have your regular dental office manager at the beginning is going to learn how to submit medical insurance. Mm-hmm. And that, so we go over how to do that at the course. You, the doctor's not going to sit there and try to submit a medical form. Uh, yeah, we'll give you the codes, but you're going to really pull your hair out when you know, six weeks later, you get something from, you do your verification of benefits, you submit and you think you did a great job and the patient's happy. And then they, (laughs) and then, and then they reject the claim because something wasn't right. Uh, And then you have to do an appeal and then you have to do a second appeal and then they eventually, Mm -hmm. they pay you. But this is the nature of the beast. And we have to be honest that the the medical insurance is uh, very, very difficult so um, if a dentist is watching this, then you, you know that we're being uh, surrounded and encroached upon by all these uh, DSOs right now. Um, mm-hmm. it, everybody's buying up multiple offices and we don't have to throw names out, but on Long Island, there's eight large groups right now that are buying offices everywhere. Guess what? They don't do this because they right. can't. They're not set up to submit for medical insurance. Mm-hmm. The medical insurance in this area is very difficult, and you have to. You can outsource it, and we we have billing companies that we we can suggest. And I think at the beginning, it's worth it to use that because then your office manager would have somebody to you know hold their hand and right. help them with the claim. And it's a couple hundred bucks for a claim, but that's worth it because you're going to be making a few thousand. The appliance is going to be a few hundred and maybe the billing company will be a, you know, a couple hundred, yeah. uh, but that's worth it because that, it's a learning curve for your front desk person or your, your dental office administrator to learn about the insurance. So, yeah, it, it, I'll be honest. It's not easy. This is the hardest part. The dentist has the easy job. Right. And, and the hygienist is really the team player and she's the one that's picking up all these little clues. She's the one that's playing Columbo, if you will. <laughs> and she all out. And I'm like, I spy, like, I love you. Yep. <laughs> it's perfect. You know, you see this patient and really, what are you looking at? Yeah. You know, so frequently we miss 
Mm -hmm. We miss the forest through the or trees. Not, our eyes not trained, you know, from hygiene school to pick up on this stuff. It's not the stuff we were trained to catch, you know? So until exactly. like you said, the first thing you got to do, you got to go to a course. You got to know exactly what it is that you even want to be looking for and understand what you're seeing and the impact that it's having on the entire body, not just the mouth. Exactly. Exactly. So, so yeah. So you ask the question and the question is, how do you get started? And you get started by involving your team. Mm -hmm. The answer to your question is get buy-in from your team. Yeah. And what that means is we ask the clinical, we, uh, a clinical uh, person in your office, your assistant to mm -hmm. come as a dentist, the dentist and an administrative staff member. So you yeah. need three people. Every office has three people. Yeah. You know, and the doctor will call me sometimes say, well, I'm only bringing, I'm only coming by myself. I said, you're not going to be that successful. Yeah, I'm only coming by that's myself. That's so yeah. how much is it? I said, it's the same price. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you want, you your office. You want to bring four people, it's the same price. Yeah. Uh, most people, it's uh it's usually um three people is is sufficient. Yeah. Because then you get the conversations going during the day. You have a uh, morning huddle, you look at the schedule, yeah. and patients haven't been in a while, you look at their medical histories a little bit. That's what we started to do at the beginning. And whoa, well, we got suspicious about this one or that one or the other one. And then you have to learn some scripts. Mm -hmm. uh, the Definitely. scripts would be, uh, which we go over in the course, you know, how do you sleep at night? How do you feel in the morning? Do you have cranky pants when you wake up in the morning? Yeah. Things like that. It's and really, you have really to be able, you know, it's a different script depending on the patient because some patients you have to tread lightly with. Some patients, yeah. they'll, they're more than happy to hear whatever you're talking about. But I'm always telling, you know, other providers and hygienists and, you know, whatever that, you know, the patient in the end, they, the retention they're going to have to your practice because you're valuing the person that's in the chair. You know, it's not just like you're trying to make money off them, but you're truly valuing them as a person, their health, how all of this is affecting them on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, because it affects their whole life. It could affect their family's life, their relationships, oh, their okay. children, you know, I mean, the list goes on. Yep. <laughs> Um, do you have any last words before we wrap things up? No, I just, uh, I'll tell you that uh, I don't care if you're a dentist that just got out of dental school or if you've been practicing for 40 years. Uh, the learning in this area is so exciting. Yes. Uh, it's, it's so exciting because uh, you, you really, it will explain things that you've been watching and seeing for all the years. If you're at 40 years out, if you're just starting, it will change the way you approach patient. Mm -hmm. So I think it really applies to everybody. Oh, a hundred percent. Absolutely. Well, I will, I'm going to link the book. I'm going to link your Lambert questionnaire. We'll link the courses. Um, we'll have okay. everybody checking that, you know, checking that stuff out. And thank, thank you, you so, so much for taking the time. We will definitely have you back to talk about chapter. What is it? Chapter nine is the dental. I think we, right? Yes. Dentistry. Yeah. yeah. That's going to be. Well, we will great. have yeah. to have you back to talk about that because that would be, that would be awesome. awesome. So you're doing, um, doing so a yeah, great job. Thank, thank you. So thank you so much. Um, you have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, we'll talk soon. Okay.